I would now like to call the September 15th, 2021 Longmont Sustainability Advisory Board meeting to order. Could we please start with a roll call? Yes, Kate Collardson. Here. Adam Reed. Here. Um, Charles Musgrave. Present. And Robert Davidson. Here. And I got emails from Mary Lynn, um, Jim Metcalf, and Kay Volmeyer that they'll not be able to attend tonight. For staff members, we have Lisa Knobloch. Here. Annie Noble. Here. Um, Tim Ellis. Here. And Heather McIntyre is here. And Council Member Christensen is here. All right. Chair, you have a quorum. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we acknowledge that Longmont sits on the traditional territory of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and other indigenous peoples. We honor the history and the living and spiritual connection that the First Peoples have with this land. It is our commitment to face the injustices that happened when the land was taken and to educate our communities, ourselves, and our children to ensure that these injustices do not happen again. Yes, Adam. I'll just say something on that note. I was delighted to see that Longmont announced in their newsletter that they formed this sister city relationship with the Northern Arapaho tribe. I actually found that out when I was up in Wyoming. So that was delightful to hear. That is great. Yeah, Polly. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. Not too astute. Um, they're coming down on Saturday and there'll be a public ceremony um, at the museum. Uh, I think that's open to the public at three o'clock. Okay. And so if you would like... Um, you should check with the museum, but I think that's open to me to to the public, and uh, they're really you know wonderful people, and it's a very long drive. So, but it it really is. Um, it's very nice that we can that our children can go back and forth. I hope that this uh, continues uh, after you know for forever. I don't want it to be yet another bunch of broken promises, right. which as we know is <laughs> the history of racial relationships. Right. Well, and you you worked on that to make that happen, Polly, uh, Polly is that true? Yeah, yeah. And I've been up to the Wind River Reservation and uh, that was, it was very, very nice. They were extremely generous to us. They put us up and they, we did a sweat lodge and only one person keeled over. <laughs> so, you know, he didn't die. <laughs> it's good. But it was, it was very, very nice to have a chance to talk to various people and to meet the kids. The kids have come down one time, but that was before COVID. So hopefully by this spring, we can do that again and keep that relationship up. Cause I, it, it, it's, really, really important that we learn to understand other people's experiences. And theirs is, the experience of Native Americans is uh, something that I don't think anybody can picture unless they are Native American, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you for the, your work on that. A Adam, you're- Just a quick clarifying question. How late will that run? Because we have that Fiesta food truck rally and I don't know if it's possible to catch the Longmont Museum event after that. Um, I don't know. I know that the, you could, as I said, you can probably check the museum, but I, what I have down is we have a lunch with them and then we have a ceremony that I thought was public. It's at three o'clock. I don't think it'll be very long, maybe just a, a 45 minutes or so. And then we have a dinner with them, which is really, I hope I get a chance to talk to people, so. Yeah, it, it's three o'clock at the museum, but also the information I have doesn't say how late it, it goes until, so. Yeah. Okay. okay. 
thank thank you, Polly, for all of that, all of your work yeah. and all of that background. Sure. My honor. Okay, the next item is the approval of the minutes from the last meeting. Does anybody have any amendments or would anyone like to make a motion to approve? Yeah, I'll, I'll move that we approve the minutes from last week's meeting as presented. Thank you. Any second? I'll second that motion. Great, all in favor? Thank you. Okay, um, it is now time for the public invited to be heard. Do we have anyone who we would like to speak? don't have anyone who's joined us, so we can move on. Okay, great. Um, are there any revisions uh, to the agenda or documents that need to be submitted from staff? No? Great. Okay, uh, on to general business. Uh, Lisa, that's you. Uh, the Go EV resolution. Yeah, excellent. So um, we had a couple of other agenda items that were supposed to be on tonight that got bumped because um, they weren't quite ready yet. So one was the sustainability tax priorities, um, and they actually haven't released the application yet. So we will have time to come back to you in the October meeting for that. Uh, and then Tim also had something um, that we put on the October agenda. So uh, tonight's meeting might be pretty, pretty short. And see, but we'll see. You never know. Uh, no, so <laughs> I am going to pull up this presentation and see if I can. Or Heather, are you going to pull it up? Sorry, I realized I sent it to you. So that probably makes more sense. Ah. Oh, there we go. Perfect. You can see it now, Lisa? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, all right, so I want to chat with you all about the Go EV resolution uh, that is going to council on September 28th. So you can go to the next slide, Heather. Uh, so the Go EV Cities is actually a statewide initiative to encourage cities and counties to accelerate electrification in the transportation sector. The resolution itself represents a commitment to develop policies and strategies to meet cities' emissions reduction goals and provide cleaner air, more affordable transportation, and leadership for greater EV adoption nationwide. And the impetus of it was really to, when the state came out with their EV plan with a goal of getting a million EVs on the road in Colorado by 2030. So this initiative really came out of what can local cities uh, and other jurisdictions do to help the, meet that statewide goal. Uh, to date, there are, um, eight EV cities, so kind of the folks that you would think of that are involved in a lot of these areas. So Avon, for Collins, Boulder County, Denver, City of Boulder, Summit County, and the City of Golden are all designated now as uh, Go EV cities. And now Longmont um, has an opportunity to do that as well. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so just a bit of background, transportation is one of the 10 topic areas in the sustainability plan. Uh, this is our objective here, and these are the targets that are noted in the sustainability plan and where we're at in meeting those targets. The first one kind of has that red X on it um, because we have, we've had quite a bit of challenge and in internal conversations about how do we best measure equitable access to transportation infrastructure. Uh, and we've been working with some of our GIS folks to try to map things like a walk score and bike score and sidewalk, um, completed sidewalks and things like that. But we've just really, we haven't really landed on really good ways to do that. Uh, so we do hope to have that better defined as we get into the sustainability plan and envision Longmont's up updates next year and really use uh, the transportation roadmap, which um, you all are familiar with, to inform that since that was really rooted in equity and I think will help us better define those equity metrics with regards to transportation. Uh, we're doing pretty well in the air quality area um, other than ozone, which as I'm sure you all know, um, we are not doing well on in the front range in general is in, it's not in compliance in terms of ozone. And then the third target uh, came out of our greenhouse gas inventory and we're really holding steady there, but we've also modified that um, target a bit, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, you can move to the next slide, please. 
These are the strategies that are already listed in the sustainability plan. And I've highlighted just the ones that are related to EVs, which are looking at um, both our fleet and then also um, encouraging EV uptake in the community and improved charging infrastructure. And these uh, got incorporated into the transportation roadmap. And go to the next slide. And then just a reminder, if you all recall, EVs um, particularly focused on charging infrastructure in the downtown area was also identified as a priority within the Climate Action Task Force recommendations. Um, so there's a lot of focus on EVs. You can go to the next slide. Uh, and then, as I mentioned just a minute ago, we kind of modified that uh, transportation emissions target um, to be more of a straight target for greenhouse gas emissions related to the transportation sector rather than a mobile fuel consumption target, which was just confusing to folks. So it's essentially the the, uh, the, the target itself really hasn't changed just more the way that we're measuring it and the units associated with that has changed. So it's really reducing transportation emissions 40% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. And that'll help meet our overall greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, the two main components of that, and most of you I think have seen this slide, it was part of my climate action update a couple months ago, but just to reiterate, the two main components within that are increasing EVs um, which we have a goal 30% by 2030 and 90% by 2050. We're at 2.13%. So we have a long, long way to go on that front. And then also increasing mode share, which we were actually doing pretty well in 2019. But as you can imagine, um, COVID has really um, hit that sector hard. So it's going to take a while for us to, to recover from that. Um, and you can go to the next slide. So in order to create a really coordinated action plan to achieve our goals in, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector, uh, we applied for and got funds from the Boulder County Sustainability Tax to develop the Equitable Carbon Free Transportation Roadmap. Um, and as we've talked to you about before, the roadmap really pulls together a lot of the transportation and equity related plans to really um, give us this roadmap on how we can get to those transportation um, goals and it establishes three base priorities and four equity priorities priorities that really help to support the creation of a healthy living environment that effectively engages all members of our community. Sorry. Um, and, and so I've marked just on this graphic here, all of the places that are related to EVs. So you can see it really shows up and builds upon each other as we get toward that goal in 2050. And one of the strategies that was identified was a Go EV resolution. And we had initially identified that for 2023, but we are actually approached from um, by some folks from SWEEP, if, if you all are familiar with that organization, it's the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project. And they do um, a lot of technical support and research around um, all things energy and kind of electrification oriented um, work. So they actually approached us and they said, hey, there's a lot going on in this area. The last week of September is EV Drive Week, which you all may be familiar with. And it's a good opportunity to, to bring this resolution forward. Uh, so we decided to go ahead and jump on that opportunity. Um, so you can go to the next slide, Heather. Thank you. So the Longmont Go EV resolution details um, Longmont's leadership on climate action and our commitment to developing those policies and strategies to meet our transportation electrification goals in the areas of fleet, public transportation, ride sharing, and um, private vehicles as well. The resolution was included in your packet, but these are just, I just wanted to touch on the highlights um, that are included in the resolution. It does lay out some specific targets um, where we could identify them, as well as more of a general commitment to pursue policies and strategies in these areas. And then really a central focus on, on equity using those equity priorities that were defined in the roadmap. So we can go to the next slide. 
So as I mentioned, the resolution will go uh, in front of council as part of the consent agenda on September 28th. So we won't have a presentation that goes along with that, um, but I will be available in case uh, council has questions on that. Um, and then as I mentioned, that is electric drive week. So hopefully, hopefully council will pass the resolution. It will give us a good opportunity to talk up the work that we're doing around EVs. And then uh, Sustainable Resilient Longmont is hosting an EV drive event on Sunday, October 3rd. And we'll have um, a table at that event. And Tim from LPC is going to be speaking at that event as well. So um, hopefully that'll also be a good opportunity for talk up, to talk up that Longmont is hopefully at that point a go EV city. Uh, we also have the DOE grant, which we've talked to you all about before. And a follow-up plan from that. We have not heard back yet. Um, on that grant, but hopefully pretty soon in the next couple of weeks, hopefully we should know by the next um, uh, SAB meeting coming up in October. Um, but regardless, we really have, that really helped us build a pretty strong foundation and a pretty strong team internally with some external partners uh, to pursue a lot of that work in the, in the transportation roadmap, particularly regarding transportation electrification. So we're really excited about all the work that's happening in that area. And then we'll also to continue with the roadmap implementation. Next slide. All right, so that's pretty much it. Um, I do apologize that the timing didn't really work out for us to get more direct feedback from you all in terms of crafting the resolution um, itself, but it did seem like an opportunity that really made sense for us to take advantage of with regards to the timing. Um, but I would like to be able to note in the communication, the council communication that will go along with the resolution that the Sustainability Advisory Board is supportive of the resolution itself. So I do um, want to, one, just get any feedback or questions or comments, but also hopefully have you all give me the okay to include your, your support in that communication. And there will definitely be more opportunities to craft specific targets and action as we get into the updates of the sustainability plan and envision long that next year as well. So with that, folks have questions, comments? Yeah, Adam. Yeah, Lisa, I'd just like to say that this resolution is really impressive and it's great that the city is considering it. And I especially like how it highlights some of the steps that Longmont already took. So that's great to see. I do have a question. Are we able to provide some feedback on the resolution itself or is that pretty much carved in stone right now? It's pretty much, it's, it's, we had to get it done and get it to our legal folks um, with time to get it finalized and go out in the council packet. So it's pretty well set in stone as it is. That said, I will say, please do give me your feedback because if we can use that to inform what we do um, kind of with follow-up steps, that's still helpful for us. Okay. I did have one comment, apart from like, it looks really great. In terms of the section that said, I think it was about zero emission vehicles, there was something about hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. And that caught my attention because I've worked on those before. And from my experience, I'd recommend removing that from the section. And now I think that might sound pedantic because everything's written really well. But the main reason is that those cars are a distraction from more effective solutions like battery powered electric vehicles. And like we've, we've talked about like the, how electric vehicles are really showing promise in the market, but in contrast, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, um, those are not so viable. And so like just a little small point that, that yeah. caught my attention. I, I appreciate that. And I had a similar thought. And the only reason we actually left it in there when we were talking to the folks from Sweep is because they are included in the definition of plug-in and hybrid electric vehicles that the state uses. So if we're using the same terminology, they're part of that umbrella. But I think that that's helpful for uh, information when we really get down to what are we actually going to prioritize, that we will get to choose locally whether or not we pursue hydrogen as an option. Sure. Mm -hmm. My understanding is there isn't any plan in place to have a hydrogen infrastructure for fueling cars. Not that I've heard okay. of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Other applications like aerospace and local power is a totally different story. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Charles? Yeah. So I actually had an issue with the same um, whereas as Adam had. Um, I so So just to First, quickly, um, a um, significant fraction of my um, day job 
is spent on uh, working for the Department of Energy on how to produce hydrogen. And I would second Adam's comments about hydrogen. So um, I have to be careful about that because um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm doing research on it and want to make it happen. But at the same time, I don't think it belongs there uh, in this, in this uh, initiative or this resolution. Uh, the other thing actually is uh, I have a much stronger opinion on actually is that plug-in hybrid electric vehicles are absolutely not emission-free vehicles. And 90% of the time they're running on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Most people who buy plug-in hybrid electric vehicles do not plug them in. And they are also a distraction as Adam commented for the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are also a distraction. And um, they're um, unfortunately, they have typically seven kilowatt hour batteries in them, for example, somewhere in that range, you know, yeah. seven to 10 kilowatt hour batteries. So it's incredibly small batteries. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a real, <clears throat> they're basically a fossil fuel vehicle with a, a big batter, battery in it and a big alternator. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a good electric vehicle will have anywhere from a 60 to 100 kilowatt hour battery in it, you know, somewhere in the order of 10 times the size of a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. So, so a plug-in hybrid, you know, on the hybrid, when, you, when they say hybrid, really it's 90% of, of fossil fuel, gasoline power vehicle, and maybe a 10% electric vehicle. So I, I very strongly disagree with that, that yeah. aspect of the resolution. All right. Thanks, Charles. I appreciate that. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, Adam. I had two questions. The first one that was on my mind, I think there was something about the social cost of carbon. And I don't think this needs to change in the resolution at all, but I'm just curious, what costs were you going to use? Because like that can be anywhere from like on one end to like a carbon tax to anywhere on the other side of the spectrum, which is like including all the known and anticipated costs of carbon. So I'm curious what the plans are there to calculate the number. Yeah, and I wouldn't say we have specific plans at that point in time. If we did do that, we would probably utilize the current number that the EPA is using, which I haven't looked at for a while, but last time I did see it was somewhere in the 40 to $50 range. So that's what we would probably utilize, yeah. Um, So my thought is about this, the, the equity piece, and it, it's, it's kind of broad. And I, I just, I assume that as this happens, there, the details will be very forthcoming. Yeah. Yeah. And resolutions generally are pretty broad. They're commitments, they're pretty high level. So as we get into the actual implementation, as we dig into what are we going to actually do, we'll utilize particularly resources like the Equitable Climate Action Team's equity lens and equity recommendations that they put together for the Climate Action Recommendations Report. We've been working a lot on those internally, particularly with the work that Francie has been doing, and she's not here tonight to chat about those, but um, we've been really building those up and we've been supporting different folks across the organization who are implementing this type of work to really uh, use those as criteria for the implementation or design of any strategies. So that very much would be really that when we would bring that component in, but the criteria, those four equity priorities are kind of the, our starting point for transportation as identified in the roadmap. Okay. Yeah, Great. thanks for that comment. Yeah. And so my follow-up question is how, how long are the buses going to remain free of charge? Um, that's a good question. Polly, do you have the answer to that? Um, Wait, you, you are on mute now. Yeah, I'm having trouble with my buttons. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm one of the people who promoted that idea. So I do hope um, that the next, it's, it's a year to year thing. So I, I would rather have council make at least a five year commitment because that takes it out of the realm of politics and 
other things. And it it isn't a year to year thing. It's it's what the people of this town need. It, when we did that, um, it upped the participate the ridership by thirty percent. People would love to have be able to ride the bus, but they can't afford it. If it's like five dollars each way, that's you know that's fifty dollars a week, and <laughs> that's crazy. Um, anyway, so it depends upon who's in city council. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments for Lisa? Okay, um, is anyone willing to make a motion to uh, that on this that, that will support this, that our name could be added to the supporters list? Yeah, I'll move, so moved. Okay, a uh, second? I mean, I I do have a question, Lisa, like when it's carved in stone, does that mean like council can still mark it up? I guess I don't know how this resolution process works in full. Sure, yeah, council can always make recommendations to staff to make changes to the resolution. So we, I mean, we could do that. The other thing that I will say, you know, for better or worse is re our resolutions are not binding. It's not an ordinance that actually lays something in, in code. Um, so they're generally used as as guidelines for what staff does in terms of implementation. Um, so, but, but city council definitely is council members can make recommendations of staff to make changes before it's finalized, but then we would have to bring something back for them to vote on. Yeah, Polly. Polly, go ahead. Um, so, uh, yes, when you do a resolution, you do have to write it, run it by the legal department so that they make sure there's nothing untoward. So it takes a little bit of time. But once it gets to council, it also, you know, if you have suggestions, send them to me and um, I will try to um, add them. Then it'll have to go through, well, if it's a resolution, it just can be passed. But if we make changes, then it has to come back. And, but it'll still be passed if, if the um, majority agrees. But you do have to be sure in every stage that you're not doing something that's illegal. Yeah. <laughs> and that requires time because we have a fairly limited uh, legal department for the city. The thing that I can definitely do is in the council communication, if assuming that you all vote to support it. I can I can definitely make a note based on your comments tonight saying that um, sustainability advisor, advisory board members noted the need to prioritize electric vehicles over hydrogen or plug-in hybrid vehicles or something along those lines, um, just to say, yes, we acknowledge that this is in the resolution and the direction is, or, advice from the, the board members is to not pursue those particular options. So I can craft language in the communication that also captures that sentiment as well. Yeah, so I think we, that would be a better way to do it. Yeah, I would also prefer not to have to revise yeah. it and come come back because um, that's a whole yeah. process in and of itself. So if you all feel okay with us doing that, that's probably yeah. the route. That it would be going. cleaner and faster, yes. So, so say that again, Lisa, you're going to craft language that says what, what, what does what exactly um, in terms of how does this work? It, it, it just advises council that the, the advisory board has issues with it or what, what's, I didn't quite Yeah, so catch. I can just note in, with every item that goes to city council, we draft what's called a council communication and it provides all the background information and um, staff feedback and all of that sort of stuff. And so I can include, I have a kind of placeholder sentence in there right now that says that this was brought to the sustainability advisory board at your September meeting and you all were supportive of the resolution. I can modify that statement to say something along the lines of just noting the concerns around hydrogen and plug-in electric vehicles and that your feedback is to prioritize electric vehicles rather than those two options. 
just so then when city council sees that they they know that that's your specific feedback with regards to the resolution. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand that. That's that sounds good, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, the one, you know, I don't want to be <coughs> too strong on this, but um, the the one issue with that one whereas is that it's factually incorrect. <laughs> so it's more than just an opinion about you know what we want to prioritize. It's plug-in hybrid electric vehicles have a tailpipe. They have emissions. They are not zero emission vehicles. So it's factually incorrect. Um, so. Um, so I'm not sure how you want to word that, but it's, I think it's more than just, I mean, I do agree. We don't want to um, prioritize you know, we do, that. We do want to prioritize um, battery electric vehicles over hybrid or plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. But um, that one statement is just, it, it's um, sorry. <laughs> it really bothers you. me. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'll, I'll figure something out and I'll chat with the sweep folks too, because like I said, we're using the language that the state is using. And so, because we were also initially, we had initially expanded it to be, to include renewable natural gas. And we had a whole conversation with them about the, that, that explicitly doesn't fall into the category of zero emission vehicles for other reasons. And so we decided, you know, that it made more sense for us to use the link, the standard language that the state is using. So that's what I can note in the council communication of this is why we chose this language. This is the feedback from the sustainability advisory board, if you all are comfortable with that. And I'll, I can share with you the final communication for your, for the next meeting as well. And I'll give that feedback to those sweet folks. I'm not sure that, I'm not sure what power influence they have in that process, but they're the ones that are really helping advise communities on this work. So I think that's helpful information and feedback for them to have. I, I can imagine there's interests, interests that have resulted in that language in the first place, <laughs> but I, don't, I can't say I know the history of all of that. Yeah. Yeah, Adam. Yeah, we'll just second what Charles said. And Lisa, thanks for doing this. Really appreciate it. Yep. Thank you yeah, all. I, I agree. I uh, I appreciate you doing all this and, and accommodating all the uh, the concerns, but they're legitimate. And um, mm -hmm. so I don't think we actually voted. So, so all we, have favor, a, we have yeah. a motion on the table, but we need a second. So we had a motion from Robert um, to... Uh, support the resolution. And and maybe we could add uh, with the um, the notes that were that Lisa took. <laughs> I'm sure that is not the language we have to use. Um, so with that, does that um, is there a, a second? I'll second the motion with the amendment that um, Lisa will add the um, the uh, comments then forward to council. Thank you, Charles. All in favor. <laughs> okay, great. Awesome. Thank you all. And I think that's it for me. Um, Thanks, Lisa. Yes, appreciate it, Lisa. Okay, so the next item is other business, and there's nothing on the agenda, so I'm assuming there is none. Okay. Uh, so then we have two items from staff. First is the ca carbon fee and uh, dividend act resolution. Yep, and so that's just an announcement to let you know that uh, Council Member Joan Peck did. Uh, bring that to council a couple weeks ago and recommended that staff bring back a resolution. Um, so that's similar to the resolution that you all saw several months ago from the Citizens Climate Lobby folks. So um, I went ahead and put that all together. So that is also on the consent agenda for the same evening, September 28th. So I just wanted to let you all um, know that. And similarly, I did put a council communication together I think for it was the end of July when when I brought that forward a, a month or so ago, and similarly noted how you all had voted on 
that resolution and that some of you also had concerns. So that's also noted in that as well. So, but that's going the same, the same night. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Adam. I'll just add that regardless of where you stand on that particular resolution, there is a lot of activity in the US Congress right now. Mm -hmm. And in specifically in terms of climate policy, and it's enough to make your head spin, but I think there's just so much going on that regardless of how much time you spend looking at any one of those topics, it would be helpful just to give you some sense of some of the stuff that's going on at the national level and how it might uh, impact Longmont and some ideas uh, that that could be used here. But it's definitely a fire hose to drink from at the moment. Right. It's exciting, though. So, so uh, Adam, are you talking about the three and a half trillion dollar uh, social infrastructure bill that is being debated now, and, and the uh, climate aspects and the um, electric electric vehicles aspects of that? Is that what you're referring to? I wasn't quite sure. That, as well as a bunch of bills that got, well, a bill that got passed recently um, through the Senate, and then um, legislation back in back in last year, where there was a lot of climate mm -hmm. legislation um, rolled yeah. up into a big package. So not just what's going on now, but what has been going on recently. I think there's just a lot of activity just beyond EVs, just in terms of like very broad policy related to climate in general. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Yes, it's exciting. Okay. Um, so the next item is the uh, PRPA meeting topics agenda and agendas. Um, yes, Lisa, is that you? Yep. So I also just wanted to bring that information back to you all at our last meeting when we were talking through the questions from that you all had from PRPA and the responses. And there was a suggestion to potentially get meeting agendas ahead of the PRPA board meeting so that you all could potentially review the topics that are being discussed and if if warranted make recommendations to city council based on some of those. And we did chat with Dave Hornbacher, who's the director of LPC, who let us know that the, the timing of those meetings, their meeting agenda packets go out a couple of days before the meeting and their meetings don't, I, it was, it's like the meeting agendas come out the day after the SAB meetings and then the PRK meetings are like the following Tuesday or Wednesday or something like that. So the, the timing wouldn't allow for us to do that, what you all had suggested, but uh, we did chat with LPC folks and decided what we would propose to you all essentially is for Tim or somebody else from LPC to do like a standing quarterly update to you all on um, progress and priorities and focus areas that PRPA is focusing on so that you all can stay more in the loop on, on some of the things about where are we at with regards to renewable energy, uh, the DERS work, other things like that. Um, Dave also said a lot of their meetings are pretty just general business oriented, but that'll allow Tim to really consolidate that information and keep you all in the loop. And if something is coming up um, that provides opportunities for you to provide feedback to city council or direction to city council that um, we can bring those opportunities to you. Uh, Tim, do you wanna add anything to that? Sorry, um, no, I think you covered it. You know, we'll, we'll do our best to go through what they talked, what they talked about the directors meeting. I don't even attend those or see those meetings either. Um, I kind of just rely on Dave to, to give us the direction going forward, but I can, I'll, uh, for, for, for the, the, um, the needs of, of, of the sustainability board, I'll, I'll, I'll get together with Dave and see if um, I'll go through the agenda afterwards. I can ask him for some notes on some of the items that may be of interest to the sustainability board. And like Lisa said, a lot of them are just general business things that are of no interest to anyone. <laughs> but uh, certainly there are things that come around that you would be interested in and, and would, would like to take a deeper dive on. If there's any, like if they're voting on any kind of movement forward on um, you know, purchasing generation or, or future transmission, um, you know, like, the, like they're, there's a whole goal with Excel Energy to partner with Piesco 
to build a lot of wind out in the east side of Colorado and they have to build transmission there. So there's a lot of like long-term plans I think they're considering now, um, in the, in the, but they're in the very general planning process. The one, I th- one of the items I think will definitely play into it and which is I'm, I'm directly involved is we had the DER study, which recently wrapped up and, and there's two committees coming out of that. One is involved in planning and one is involved in programs. I'm on the programs team uh, my director and um, Lutz is on the planning team. So we're going to be directly talking with not only Platte River, but all the other um, owners, member cities on how, you know, we're strategizing around DERS, which is, I think is going to be really interesting for this group to, to, to hear about. And uh, cause there's going to be, you know, the, 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 the biggest role the city is going to play potentially in our, in our, in our future for meeting our goals is how we have distributed energy resources locally in all four of our cities, how we know where they are, how we interact with them, manage them, operate them, or, or just uh, understand how they're operating in order to, to manage the grid to become 100% renewable. So, so DERS is a really big role that I think Longmont and the other cities are going to play in the future. And, and we're, and you know, I'm myself and, and my director are directly involved in that process. So I'll be reporting up on that pretty easily uh, whenever, you know, we have some kind of uh, resolutions or plans or, or meetings even. We're starting our meetings, I think, in mid-October sometime, and they're going to be probably monthly. So I can give a little blurb about what, what the uh, meetings were about uh, at every, you know, sustainability, sustainability board meeting so you guys can keep up with it. Okay, thank you. Um... Charles, I see your hand up. Yes, um, me again. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, so I, I made the suggestion the, um, at our last board meeting, and um, it was primarily motivated by the idea. I think that we have, um, you know, each member city has two voting members um, or representatives with uh, Pat River Power Authority, and the idea that, you know, I don't know the mayor and, and um, who the next mayor is going to be after uh, <clears throat> they're elected in November. Um, but it seemed like they might not have the expertise to be able to evaluate some of these items that come before them to vote on and that uh, the advisory board could help, you know, provide some input um, on, on things that, you know, in a combination of not having the expertise necessarily, because who knows they could, for all we know, they're a, you know, a real estate agent or something, but um, the, and then it's a little concerning that the packet goes out only a short time before um, they're voting on some of these sometimes very complex and technical issues. And so um, that was the motivation. And so knowing what happens after the fact is fine. I'm, I'm not sure if, that's even maybe it's already available through, you know, the publication of minutes or, uh, you know, the recording of, of the meetings. But, um, you know, basically it was, you know, one of the, it seemed like an opportunity for us to help. You know, we, mm-hmm. we could provide um, advice to council, but uh, providing advice to the voting members of the um, Pat River Power Authority for Longmont seems like it just seems like that's something we should push on or try to, yeah, for them to just say the packets don't go out early enough for this to happen. Seems like, okay, well, let's maybe, maybe they need to change their bylaws that the packets go out um, sooner, <laughs> give them more time to evaluate some of these important things that they're evaluating uh, that they're voting on. Um, you know, Charles, that's a, a, that's a fair point, you know, because you want to be involved in the decisions that need to be made for sustainability for the city. But I think what the general idea about the, the packets in the board meetings is the general business of Platte River is, is really around how the business operates. The major decisions that sustainability would be, should be involved in is when they develop a new IRP, you know, when they're coming up with those different planning documents, uh, those are, are are times when I think your input will be really valuable. But on on like a, a month to month board basics around how Platte River's economics are looking for next year, that's that's the type of thing I think Dave is saying. Yeah. You guys really, it's not really uh, part of what the sustainability board is interested in and has to evaluate for the mayor. But what you're saying 
makes is valuable. You know, if there is a decision about how what generation resources are being purchased and how the resource planning is going, that for sure would be something that you would be looped in. And, and that's not just a normal one director meet one board meeting and they're like, yep, it's fine. There's a long process behind that. And the, you know, the drafts come out, they're reviewed by you know multiple people, not only the board members. And then, you know, that's where the input would come in. The board meeting would just be like, after all that study and evaluation and input, they just say, yeah, it looks good. Let's go. You know what I mean? So the board meeting itself isn't that important. It's the process leading up to those board meetings where you guys would be involved in, in getting, giving some input on the direction that Platte River is taking with its resource mix and, and, and other, you know, items, if that makes okay, sense. Got it. But, yeah. Thanks, Tim. That, that helps a lot. Uh, yeah. Because I was, you know, in my original suggestion or question it wasn't really about you know getting the agenda <laughs> for individual meetings but it was more like helping the you know giving the, the mayor input information advice for exactly what you're talking about the times when it's actually you know useful not Absolutely. just general business <laughs> yeah no I, I you know when the draft irps come out i think it would be great if you guys could take a hard look at them and give your input because they they put them out it takes months uh, if not a year to do the final approval on those. And there's plenty of time for review and comment on that up to that final board meeting. Great. Thank, thanks, Tim. Yeah. Polly, I see your hand up. Sorry. Um, yeah, Charles, I do think that's a good idea, actually. Because, you know, Tim is right that these are business meetings and all that. But, you know, if we had left them just be business meetings, nothing would have moved. It was um, Councilwoman Peck and I and Councilwoman Martin who brought forth the um, idea that we should be um, um, fossil free by 2030. Um, so the mayor is the... the um, the head of LPC is, of course, the expert, and <laughs> thank God he's <laughs> there. But um, the but the mayor has a voice and needs to be informed. And um, I think it'd be very useful for this uh, board to be an advisor for the mayor for PRPA, just because nobody can learn everything. But um, do think when you're voting you know, who, who actually has had, uh, for all, all of city council, who has actually stood up for things and uh, regarding the sustainability. And, uh, but I, I think this board can really serve a good purpose for helping the mayor uh, be more informed. So thanks for suggesting it. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. And Lisa, I see you. Yeah, I, I also just was going to say something similar to Polly in terms of just reminding folks that Dave Hornbacher is the other voting member. And as the director of LPC, he's very well informed on all of these issues. So, um, but yeah, I do think that, that that's also um, an important point. The other thing I just wanted to note that if you all didn't know, and we can send this link out, that all of PRPA's um, meetings are also public. So people are able to attend those if those if that's something that you're also interested in um, doing it at any point in, and participating in that. Okay. Thank you. Um, and thanks. I, I just want to say thanks to Tim for being willing to, to keep us informed and um, and to Charles, I think that you're exactly right. This, we, we want to be involved in this and I, I appreciate you. Uh, stating the case very clearly. Um, okay, uh, so the next item is uh, a discussion, and thank you for putting this in here, on um, on making the, a bylaw provision for future uh, remote meetings and meeting times. Um, is... I'm not sure I, we can we can do this. I'm not opposed to to having this discussion and and making this uh, provision right now. And uh, right now, are the city buildings that there are, are are we meeting in person right now? Is anybody? 
Yes. Yes, Polly. Yes, we are meeting, but some people for their own little various reasons don't want to meet anymore because <laughs> they don't like masks. So we are, city council is meeting. Um, it's difficult now because we are supposed to wear masks all the time. So we, we can't, really can't hear what's going on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'd still yeah. rather meet in person because I think there's value, especially for city council. I, I think we've all gotten kind of used to Zoom meetings and it has some advantages in terms of time and convenience, but um, I don't think it's really a substitute for meeting in person. You know, I, I think there's a lot to, I think it depends upon the, the group that's meeting. And um, so I don't really have a dog in this fight, okay. but, you know, I, I just think whatever works and gets the most of us here um, is the best thing for us, for, for this board. I agree. Yes, Charles. So um, is, is there, so I think the um, Planning and Zoning Commission meets uh, on the third Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Is, is there, is that a problem at all to have overlapping meetings or In terms of like a conflict, uh, my my guess is there's more than one meeting room, and at city there's enough city staff to support uh, both of those meetings and things like that. Or is or is it or is it a conflict when you have two different um, city boards or commissions meeting at the same time? Uh, yeah, Polly. Um, the long the um, planning and zoning commission meets in theory twice a month, but if they don't have enough uh, really to make up a long meeting, then they just confine it to one meeting, which is usually more than long enough. <laughs> um, so it's not a matter of rooms. There are, there are rooms in the um, city hall where they could meet otherwise, but they're a fairly large board and yeah. So they usually meet in the council chambers. I don't know that that was because of a, a lack of meeting space. I think it was because they just didn't have enough stuff that's going on to warrant meeting twice a month, which is twice as much as most of us meet, you know? Yeah. So that's not, um, but, you know, we meet, we were meeting um, out of public works. We weren't meeting in the city and people meet all co kinds of places. Um, so it's, that's not usually such a big deal. It depends on the size of the board and, uh, what they're, what they deal with. We don't have usually on this board, many, um, people from the public, but boy, planning and zoning does, you know, it's, <laughs> it's very contentious <laughs> often. Okay. Um, so what we're discussing is whether or not we're going to make a provision for all of our meetings to be remote. Remind me what we're... Really, it's to um, make a provision for if you needed to meet remotely and you wanted to do that because of things like the pandemic or something, that you could do that, um, make that provision in your bylaws. Um, and then also the meeting times, you guys had kind of talked about um, switching the time to an evening evening meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you want to change that at the same time. Okay. I'm, I'm feeling hesitant with the, the low attendance from board members at this meeting to make this kind of uh, official change. Um, I, we have talked about it and not everyone there, I can think of at least one member, board member who hasn't been here for any of these um, discussions. And have, have y'all had feedback from everyone that the, or anyone about this change? Annie, <laughs> see your hand up. I was actually raising my hand just to get clarification about what this 
provision allows. So it doesn't, as I understand, and Heather, correct me if I'm wrong, but this just allows you to meet remotely if you so choose. It doesn't mandate that you in the future meet remotely. It just gives you that option. Correct. Great. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. But but on the other one, on the, the t- meeting time, it it is, it's not an option like it. D- well, and my yeah, understanding in our discussion a couple of weeks ago was that the board wanted to try out this time and mm-hmm. see if it worked to see if, you know, more members of the public were showing up and if it worked for everybody. I, mm-hmm. That was mm-hmm. my recollection, but you guys can weigh in on that. Yeah, so our previous uh, meeting when you all decided to do it at 6 p.m. instead of was like a we uh, made a provision for a special meeting time for this month. And then we are going to evaluate if we wanted to move the meetings to the 6 to 8 p.m. I did get um, an email from Kay Volmeyer, who um, is not going to be able to do evening meetings. So. um, okay. Thank you. That's mm-hmm. helpful. Um, and and she is the the sole dissenter thus far. Okay. Uh, as far as I know, I know that Mary is not feeling well today, so she wasn't able to come. And okay. Jim is out of town, so he wasn't able to join either. Okay. So the their absence has nothing to do with with the evening time. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, we we do have one member of the public who's able who's here um but it hasn't significantly increased <laughs> the number of, of public uh members of the public who are joining um what it, what does the board think um i'd love to hear thoughts on this over for the next few minutes yes Polly. Well, when we when people signed up for this, they did sign up at a at a particular time that that they could make. So I don't even if it's just one person who can't make it, I don't think we should make a decision that shuts them out because they, in good faith, um, uh, applied to go come here at three thirty in the afternoon. So you know, I I and I also don't think that people should. Um, that we we have too few people here today to make that decision, you know. So that's my I, opinion. I appreciate your opinion. Thank you, um, Robert. So for me, the evening works better. It's, it's more reliable for me. But I totally agree with Polly's point that yeah, we can't just box out someone who uh, expected a, a consistent meeting time. But how do we consider that? Uh, it looks like. K's term expires uh, in June of 2022. Is there a way to consider options for whoever may fall on the board starting at that time? So you're suggesting that when when K is uh, like her term expires, that the next person we make it clear that we are think considering moving to an evening. Um, time is that I just want to clarify that's the suggestion yeah yeah if, if it seems like the remaining members of the board would be happy to, to move to that time it would be better in general for people then it'd be great to advertise that as the meeting time for the board for future applicants I like that idea I don't know how to do it in practice <laughs> <laughs> right. um, Adam Regarding the number of folks at the public waiting to be heard, right now we only have one meeting where we're having it at six, so that's a pretty small sample size, just a sample of one. Point. So I'd suspect we'd have to do a few trials just to get some sense of how many people start to trickle in. Is that one metric we want to watch? Or um, what, are there other things that we want to pay attention to as well, like how does this work out with the staff? And you know, are there other times that might work for everyone? Like I can imagine filling out some poll poll thing, like doodle poll or something and just see if there's like some magical time that just happens to work for this group. I suspect probably not, but just a shot in the dark. I like your optimism, (laughs) Lisa. I also just wanted to throw out there that that I would say given the time that we're in and still dealing with COVID, I'm also 
not sure that we're going to, what might work or not work at this moment in time might not be the same for the future, you know, when we can all hope for (laughs) post-pandemic days as well. So, you know, just to be thinking about that, if it makes sense for you all to, to try to shift times now and see how it goes given COVID, but also, you know, my sense right now is that people are, people are also sort of retreating back into kind of day-to-day focus um, on managing life stuff and family circumstances and things like that. So it might also not, I agree with Adam, one night is, <laughs> isn't going to give you the best information, but also just given everything people are dealing with right now, you know, I don't know if it's the best period of time to be gauging that either. Um, but just to, just to be considering that as well. Thanks for that. Yeah, Charles. So uh, in in terms of the uh, ability to meet remotely, um, I like the fact that that gives us flexibility. Um, You know, who knows what comes down the pike um, in terms of what's happening with the pandemic and things like that in the future. So I I like that aspect. Uh, In terms of times, um, if we meet remotely, (laughs) I can make uh, the normal time or an evening time. If we meet in person, I can only make the evening time. So for me, um, personally, it, it, um, yeah, it's just, um, next after December, you know, starting in January, you know, my schedule will change and I can, uh, probably make the three, I'll make my schedule work so I can make the three thirty time. But until, until January, uh, I can, I can't make three thirty unless it's remote. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so what I'm thinking is that we should go ahead and, and have the, well, amend the bylaws to allow for remote meetings. Um, and then as far as the time goes, I'm, I'm a little more stumped on, on that one. Um, it, it seems that we could, in theory, have, um, say we're going to have remote meetings through the end of the year and go back to the 3.30 time and hope that, um, you know, that change will allow Kata to join. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't feel, I feel, and, and then maybe reevaluate it, the, t- the meeting times next year. I, I, yes, Heather. So at the beginning of the year, usually in January, we review the by, bylaws and meeting times and all of that anyway. So if you wanted to finish out the year, really, we just have October and November left. If you wanted to finish out the year remotely. And then I don't know if you want to keep the three o'clock time that we've been having or move it back to 330. But we had changed it at the beginning of the year to three o'clock to allow more time for the meeting since we are running over so frequently. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I, I do remember that change and, and we do tend to, I, I'm, I'm feeling hopeful about today y'all, <laughs> but we do tend to use up the two whole, the whole two hours uh, with pretty regularly. Um, so I, So let's start with the, uh, the, the, do, what do we need to do to, as far as the, the remote meetings, just say, do, do we need to have a, a vote on that? Okay. So, um, is there, well, can somebody make a motion to amend the bylaws to allow for remote meetings? I I'll make a motion. I, I like to motion that we amend the bylaws so that uh, we have the option to hold our sustainability advisory board meetings remotely. Thank you, and a second. Thank you, all in favor? Perfect, okay. Um, okay, uh, who, who wants a three o'clock meeting for the, next, for the rest of the, <laughs> the year? 
I'm fine either way. <laughs> this will well, this will allow K to join, in theory. <laughs> okay, the Adam Charles. I can't do three. I can do three thirty, but not three. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I, I have a two thirty to three thirty meeting every Wednesday that I can't. I have to attend. <laughs> It's not one of those optional ones. And I, yeah. Okay. Uh, would, uh, and would you be okay hanging on till 530 if needed? Yes. Okay. Um, and do you, and Adam, I saw you had a hand up, I think. Sure. I can do either of those times. I have a slight preference for the evening one if possible, but I would prioritize with the staff and members of the public prefer and what also maximize the chances that we can get the largest uh, group of folks in the board here. Right. I, I do think that Polly makes a really good point about, you know, the agreement when, when Kay signed up was, you know, afternoons, not evenings. And um, I, I, I do think that there's something to, to be said about sticking to that for her her term at least, um, if 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 that takes her out of the running, um, that's just not quite fair. Um, so let's can can we move it back to three thirty then? Is that going to be an issue? Do we have to do another motion for that? It would need a motion to move it to that time, but you could definitely do that if you want to. Okay, Any, uh, Charles, Dave, uh, Robert, Adam, anyone? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I'll move it. We uh, <laughs> we change our meeting start times to be the same day of the month, but at three thirty p.m. for two hours. Great. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Great. Thank you. Thanks for walking through that with me everybody okay um the next item on the agenda is items from council do you have anything for us Polly? um have any of you been to jack solar farm do you yes, know anything i went jack? last night it's the Isn't most amazing cool? place oh yes. it's great and they have i think every saturday morning um they have a tour but I think it's such an amazing place. And I think it, because what has always bothered me about solar array is that it's originally it was just stuck, you know, <laughs> it didn't move around. Uh, then it started to move a little bit, but it was still on the ground. So it takes all the ground out of use. This raises it up uh, so that you can actually get a tractor under it. You can get <clears throat> ruminants underneath it, like cows and sheep and goats and whatever, little kids. <laughs> but, you know, as climate change gets worse in the West, particularly, it is way too hot. We have way too much sun for the plants. I was really amazed to see the kinds of plants that are going bananas underneath these arrays. So you solve several problems of solar in that you don't eliminate the use of the land under it. In fact, you shield it and make it more productive. You are able to um, have to work underneath it. And um, he has, of course, a very elaborate system of um, irrigation, but so does every farmer now. I mean, farming has always been among the most technologically advanced, and yet we think of it as Oh, those backward farmers are so dumb. Actually, it's always been at the forefront of everything because we have to eat. So uh, go to Jack's if you have a chance because he's doing many, many experiments in addition to providing solar energy and providing uh, thriving plants for that are used for the Hour Center, that are used for sale, uh, that are used for all kinds of things. And he's also doing research for the um, uh, Audubon Society for CSU uh, in terms of carbon sequestration and 
water absorption and all kinds of things. It's a really interesting thing. And it's just down on, uh, just south of Oland Farms, um, a little bit down and on the other side of the street. Yeah, the other side of the road. So um, it's a great place to visit. Amen. I, I'm so glad you brought that up. I meant to, I wanted to say something along those lines. And so I'm really glad you did. Oh, and he, he's an, um, he's a very clever man because he used to be a diplomat. So before he even started installing this, he started delivering jars of honey and cookies and various plants to his neighbors and getting to know them so that they could not start some rile up some uh, anti solar garden thing. And he's a very smart guy and it's his grandpa's farm. That's who Jack was. So go. Yeah, absolutely. And just, just a, a, an amazing story, amazing research. NREL's there, uh, the Arizona, uh, the University of Arizona. It, it, they, there are just so many cool things going on there. And he, it's, it's a great story. Um, Tim. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to say, uh, right, absolutely. That's an awesome place. I got my free summer squash when I saw Byron last year there. <laughs> so I was really psyched about that. Yeah. And he went with the, with me too. We, we had a great time. Great idea. I hope the economics work out around it. Right now, they get a lot of grants. They have a lot of grants from the Department of Agriculture and NREL. And, you know, so they're getting some money to make it work. I'm really interested to see the economics afterward. And I hope that it can be a viable way to, to put up solar in this area in the future. I would love to do a community solar project with agrivoltaics in the future. Um, there are areas around our city, not so many in them anymore. But um, locally, at least it'll be local, northern Colorado, local solar combined with agriculture. I, I'm very interested in the idea and LPC is interested in the idea. So, so we're, we're going to be keeping our eye on that one. And I'm, I'm looking forward to see how economically it shakes out. I know Byron has offered his consulting services to us already to try to put up more of them in the area. So that's encouraging. For a fee, of course, not for free. <laughs> yes, I think he, he said <laughs> he's interested in the fee. Oh, I also wanted to say one more thing. Uh, last uh, next month will be my last meeting here, and then you'll get whoever God knows whoever. <laughs> but I will miss you all. But I will be here next next month. So. We'll we'll look forward to seeing you next month. <laughs> Um, yeah, and on Tim's note, that I think he said there were 50 farms in Boulder County that had the potential to do this kind of thing because they're on right on the three phase line and um, good, you know, space for it. Um, so I I'd love to see more. It really it's a first of its kind kind of thing, and it's it's really exciting work what's happening there. Um, Charles, I saw your hand. Yeah, sorry, this is probably the wrong part of the agenda to make this, but Tim Tim commented about the financial viability of Jack's solar garden and it reminded me something that could change that maybe and just a question in general. Is it, I thought I saw something about the city is uh, looking into uh, adjusting the uh, rates for power? Is that oh, right? We're always adjusting the rates for power because, you know, we have a lot of uh, well, technology is changing, and we also have a huge amount of maintenance. We have to replace the water place and the sewer place and the pipes and the, you know, everything. It, it's hugely expensive. And so, yes, we're, we're going to be raising the water rates. But it, it's a small percentage, roughly, but um, it's hard. It's very hard on people even though it may be only a couple of dollars. That, that's very hard for people who are old and uh, or poor. And it's, um, but yeah. we can't, we can't uh, not fix things. So otherwise we'll have worse problems and more expensive problems. So yes, we're planning to do that. Lisa, I see your hand. Yeah, Tim, please jump in. But <clears throat> my understanding is that Jack's solar farm is outside of LPC territory though. So anything that we would do rate wise wouldn't be applicable to them. Oh. So we, yeah. we, we, the city can't buy power from Jack's? 
Solar Garden? No, we have an all electric, con you know, contract with Platte River. But you know, there's oh. th that's a done deal, and they have they sold their subscriptions out. You know, so they're doing fine. You know, the the Boulder bought a whole bunch of it. They also have the advantage of you know, Excel actually pays for Rex through this through their uh, rate structure, uh, which we we don't do. Um, but but um, you know, there there are lots of uh, as Kate mentioned, there are lots of other areas. If we're going to do a new project, we're going to do a new project. It's not going to be Jacks. And even if a new project is located outside the city border. You know, we're, we're looking into our contract with Platte River. What is it all? What does it say? You know, what does it exactly mean when, you know, we have these interconnections? It, are there, is there some flexibility for the future if we want to get more local solar? Um, so right now we have an all requirements contract with Platte River, but, you know, to, to meet the 100% goal and also to, to spur things locally and to have a, a very efficient um, grid and support local economies, I think the opportunity is there for the future for, for this type of, of setup. And we're definitely very serious about trying to, to look at these. I get, I, I've gotten calls from folks that, from HOAs and from people who have additional acreage that wanna put up you know, a, a megawatt or two. And you know, right now, the way things are, we can't do it according to our contract, but we are in discussions with our legal team and we're talking to the other cities we're going to be talking with Platte River very soon about things like virtual net metering. You know, right now, maybe we can do it, maybe we can't. It's not specifically defined. The contract is, is loose enough, I think, so we can go in and negotiate it. You know, that, the Platte River is not opposed to say you can't do anything unless we sell it to you. It says, you, you know, we got to talk about it before you do because we got to manage the whole grid and we got to also pay our expenses. You have to pay your expenses. We got to make sure it all works for everybody, but they're not adverse to it. Um, so that's the process we're kind of starting right now. And I think it's encouraging because there's a lot of interest in, in this type of, of, of solar farms and, and, and lots of other renewable energy opportunities. So it's, it's going to be exciting. Great. Thanks for that input. This was a great little <laughs> discussion here at the end. Thanks for bringing it up, Polly. Um, okay. Uh, we are at the end of the agenda. Amazingly. Uh, one last thing, I'll draw your attention to the informational items that were included in your board packet. Um, be sure to read those. And um, that's that. Is there a motion to adjourn? I'll move that we adjourn uh, the September 15th, 2021 Sustainability Advisory Board meeting. A second. All right. All in favor. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Bye.